Venus is often called Earth's sister planet. For one thing, these two are almost the same size. Plus, Venus and Earth are very similar in mass and composition. Venus orbits the Sun within its Goldilocks, a.k.a. habitable, zone, too, just like Earth. But the differences between our home planet and Venus are more substantial than any similarities. For example, the atmosphere of Venus is 90 times as thick as what we have here on Earth. The surface temperature is so high you could melt lead there. And the air is toxic. It consists of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid. In other words, if humans decided to move to Venus, some serious terraforming, which is basically ecological engineering, would be needed first. And still, some scientists believe that Venus is an even better candidate for terraforming than Mars. And there are several suggestions on how to do it. One of the ideas involves the use of genetically engineered algae to fix carbon into organic compounds. Unfortunately, the more researchers study this method, the less plausible it becomes. The main problem is that the production of organic molecules from carbon dioxide needs hydrogen. But this element is extremely rare on Venus. This planet doesn't have a protective magnetosphere and its upper atmosphere is exposed to direct erosion by the solar wind. That's why it has lost most of its original hydrogen to space. Also, any carbon that was bound up in organic molecules would be converted back into carbon dioxide in no time due to the ultra-hot surface environment. And Venus wouldn't even begin to cool down until after the removal of the largest part of carbon dioxide. The next idea was to bombard Venus's atmosphere with hydrogen. As a result, water and graphite would be produced. This water would fall down to the planet and cover almost 80% of its surface, forming vast oceans. To do it, we would need loads of hydrogen, so it would have to be harvested directly from one of our solar system's ice giants or their moons. This suggestion also involves iron aerosol, getting added to the atmosphere of Venus. It could be derived from a number of sources, like the moon, asteroids, or mercury. The resulting atmosphere would be around three bars, which is basically three times more surface pressure than on Earth. It would also mainly consist of nitrogen. With time, some of it would dissolve into new oceans, reducing atmospheric pressure even more. There's also an idea of solar shades. A series of small spacecraft or a single large lens might be used to divert sunlight from the planet's surface. This could probably reduce the insane temperatures on the planet. Venus absorbs twice as much sunlight as our planet. It's believed to have played a big role in the runaway greenhouse effect, which has made the planet what it is today. Such a shade could be based in space. This way, it would also serve to block the solar wind, thus reducing the amount of radiation the surface of Venus is exposed to. This radiation is a huge issue when it comes to the habitability of the planet. If this method indeed managed to cool Venus down, it would lead to atmospheric CO2, becoming liquid or frozen and getting deposited on the surface as dry ice. Solar reflectors could also be positioned in the atmosphere or on the surface of the planet. In this case, they could be large reflective balloons, sheets of carbon nanotubes or graphene or something totally different. One of the coolest suggestions is to build cities above Venus's clouds. This way they could act as both solar shields and as processing stations. The first colonists would live there, acting as terraformers gradually converting the atmosphere of the planet into something livable. Later, they would migrate to the surface. In our solar system, most planets spin counterclockwise, but not Venus. This rebel planet decided to spin clockwise, and scientists are still trying to figure out why. By the way, why do planets rotate in general? What defines the speed of their rotation? Does the sun rotate? Buckle up and let's try to answer these questions. Venus is the second planet from the Sun and the hottest planet in our solar system. Did you know that Venus is sometimes called Earth's twin? 
That's because it's similar in size and composition to our own planet. But that's where the similarities end, because Venus is a pretty crazy place, to say the least. For example, the weather. On Venus, it's always hot and cloudy. And when I say hot, I mean it like it's over 800 degrees Fahrenheit there. And those clouds? They're not made of water like the ones on Earth. Instead, they're made of sulfuric acid. So yeah, you wouldn't want to go outside without a really good sunscreen on Venus. If you look at the photos taken from its surface, you can see these toxic yellow clouds and cracked, desolate landscapes. And the spacecraft that captured this turned off almost immediately after sending these photos. Poor fella. But the surface of Venus isn't just some solid, dark, flat land. In fact, Venus has mountains that are taller than Mount Everest. These mountains aren't made of rock like the ones on Earth, though. Instead, they're made of a kind of volcanic material that's denser than... Venus is a pretty creepy place that holds many mysteries. One of them has been puzzling scientists for years, and this is the planet's rotation. Most planets in our solar system rotate counterclockwise, but Venus isn't like the other girls. It rotates clockwise, and that's not all. It also rotates around the sun faster than it rotates around itself. In other words, a year on this planet passes faster than a day. It's almost like Venus made being quirky its life mission. But why is that? Well, scientists have a few theories. The most popular theory says that Venus was actually spinning counterclockwise like the other planets, but then something happened to flip it around. And what could that something be, you ask? A planet-sized object. Yep, astronomers believe that something huge once collided with Venus, causing it to spin in the opposite direction. You can imagine this like a cosmic billiard shot, with this mysterious huge object being the cue ball and Venus being the target ball. But we can't actually say that Venus is spinning the wrong way. There's no such thing as a wrong direction of spin in the universe. This is actually called the retrograde rotation. This is when a planet rotates in the opposite direction to its orbit around the Sun. Venus, for example, has a retrograde rotation, which means that the Sun rises in the west and sets in the east on that planet. So now, when the horoscope says something like Mercury in retrograde, you'll know what it means. Oh, but Venus isn't the only weird one in our solar system. There are definitely some wacky ways that planets can rotate. For example, most planets in our solar system spin around an imaginary line called an axis. This axis is usually straight up and down in relation to the planet's orbit around the Sun. However, some planets like Uranus have a tilted axis which means it's almost on its side in relation to its orbit. This tilt causes the planet's poles to be nearly in the same place as its orbit. The result? As the planet orbits the Sun, different parts of it receive different amounts of sunlight, causing extreme seasonal variations. For example, one pole might experience continuous sunlight, while the other is in complete darkness for a long time. Uranus is the only planet in our solar system that rotates on its side. Scientists think that it could repeat Venus's history. Once upon a time, a large impact knocked Uranus off its original axis of rotation, causing it to tilt at an angle of 98 degrees. We should be grateful for Jupiter. Its crazy gravity pulls all the asteroids and protects us from such collisions. All this is somewhat similar to tidally locked planets. Imagine going on a date with a planet, but instead of being charming and mysterious like you'd hoped, it's just staring at you with the same face all night long. That's basically what it's like to hang out with a tidally locked planet. Tidally locked planets are planets that rotate around their axis at the same rate that they orbit their star. This means that the same side of the planet always faces the star while the other side is in permanent darkness. Being tidally locked can have some weird effects on the planet's climate and weather. The side facing the star can become extremely hot, while the other side can be incredibly cold. The atmosphere on the planet can also get pretty wild, with strong winds blowing from the hot side to the cold side. 
And it doesn't have to be planets only. Our moon also works this way. Did you know that we always see only one side of the moon? That's because it's tidally locked to the Earth. We can also take the dwarf planet Pluto as an example. It has a strange rotational relationship with its largest moon, Charon. They're tidally locked, which means that they always face each other with the same side. As a result, Pluto and Charon appear to waltz around a common center of gravity, creating a unique dance in space. But the oddities of our solar system don't end there. There are also planets with super fast rotations. While most planets rotate at a fairly sedate pace, some of them are sonic levels fast. Jupiter, for example, rotates once every 9 hours and 56 minutes, which means that it has a day that's less than 10 hours long. That's fast enough to cause the planet to bulge out at its equator. And also, this rapid rotation creates strong bands of winds that can reach speeds of up to 400 miles per hour. And if all this still seems logical and kinda makes sense, then how about chaotic rotations? Yep, some planets have a rotation that's so irregular and unpredictable that it's known as chaotic rotation. This is often caused by the gravitational influence of nearby moons or other planets. And it's mostly the case with moons and small objects like that. In our solar system, some moons of Pluto, Saturn, and Neptune have chaotic rotation. By the way, the Sun rotates too, just like the planets. However, its rotation is not uniform. The equator rotates faster than the poles. Pretty weird, isn't it? This phenomenon creates a magnetic field that's responsible for phenomena like sunspots and solar flares. But all this raises an interesting topic. Why do planets rotate in the first place? This may sound like a silly question, but can you answer it? The answer might be trickier than you imagine. It all started around 4.5 billion years ago with the formation of our solar system. When it formed, it started as a large cloud of gas and dust. As the cloud began to contract due to its own gravity, it began to spin faster and faster like a spinning top. This spinning motion caused the cloud to flatten into a disk-like shape. As the cloud continued to contract, the center became denser and hotter, eventually forming the sun. Meanwhile, the material in the disk began to clump together and form planets. But because the disk was already spinning, this spinning motion was inherited by the planets as they formed. In other words, the planets rotate by inertia. They inherited the spinning motion of the cloud of gas and dust from which they formed. This is known as the conservation of angular momentum. This is the same principle that causes ice skaters to spin faster when they bring their arms in. And that's a wrap on the wacky world of planet rotations. From the lightning fast spin of Jupiter to the bizarre backwards rotation of Venus, it's clear that our solar system is full of surprises. But thanks to the laws of physics and the gravitational pull of the sun, these planets continue to spin on, keeping time with the steady beat of the cosmos. Stay tuned. Ah, Earth. The third rock from the sun. The blue planet. You get it. Its atmosphere is made up of around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. A nice balance for any living creatures to breathe. The weather here is also perfect for life to exist, unlike places like Saturn, Mercury, or any other celestial object in our solar system. We have the troposphere to thank for that. It's the densest part of the atmosphere on our planet and is 5 to 9 miles wide. It's the layer of the atmosphere that always affects our weather and secures the right conditions for life to exist and to have bodies of water. Earth is just sitting in its orbital path, minding its own business, revolving around the Sun, until BAM! Venus and Mars swoop in and spoil the fun. No one wants to leave poor Earth alone. These two relatively large celestial objects moving toward Earth will have dire consequences for our planet, starting with changes in its orbiting trajectory path. The planet's orbits in the solar system have to maintain the right balance so that nothing goes haywire. Of course, if any large object approaches Earth, 
it would throw our orbiting path off course. The planets will revolve around each other, which will cause plenty of natural disasters on our lands. This will also affect our rotation timing, potentially slowing it down. Days will not flow, but drag by. Animals that rely on daytime will need to readjust their biological clocks. Nocturnal animals will also need to figure out how to cope with the long nights. Humans have adjusted pretty well to the 24 hours a day timing. Time itself is just a human construct to measure things. We'll have a tough time sleeping and adjusting to the stretched day. Marine animals rely on the natural current flow to migrate around the oceans. With Mars and Venus crashing the party, it looks like they will also need to find new paths. Birds migrating to other lands throughout the year will also be confused and not know what to do. In general, the Earth's temperature will rise, and massive heat waves and permanent climate changes will occur. This brings us to our next issue, the heat. The radical temperature rise will turn everything into a barren desert. It'll be summer all year long, especially if Venus is in the picture. Most of the planet will dry up and won't be suitable for growing crops. Venus is hot, I mean really hot. Even though it's not the closest planet to the Sun, it's still the hottest. The temperatures on Venus are close to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which will melt you like an ice cube. The lands on Venus are generally flat, probably due to the temperatures. It's mainly hot because its atmosphere is thick and traps the hazardous gases inside. If Venus inches its way towards us, it'll invite those gases to our atmosphere and compromise it. Mars, or the red planet as we know it, is very cold. That might stay the same if it starts rotating around us. It's also home to the largest dormant volcano in our solar system, which makes Mount Everest look like a tiny bush compared to a tree. With so much instability, it might just wake up one day and spew out molten lava. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, which makes the planet chilly. Its gravity is quite similar to ours. It's actually very cold and has ice caps in the poles covered with carbon dioxide. The same is true for Mercury. You can only last there as long as you can hold your breath and be in the sweet spot between the sunrise and sunset. The three planets orbiting each other will eventually collide. It's just a matter of time. And the moon, just hanging out like a fly on the wall, will be so insignificant that something will eventually throw it off course and another planet will capture it to its orbit. Or, in the most dire case, it will collide with one of the two intruding planets. Earth will experience extreme tidal waves like nothing before. The two new planets revolving around Earth will cause a major imbalance, making our gravity shift out of control. Each tidal wave will be bigger than the previous one and will cover the dry land. Plenty of little scattered islands in the oceans will be completely submerged. Coastal cities and towns will also be home to fish. Flat countries in general will need boats to get around. Dams and dikes won't be enough to stop the water from coming in. Everyone needs to move towards higher ground to escape the floods. With the climate getting hotter, the polar caps will melt like ice cream on a sweltering summer day and add to the water level rising. Within a few months, the whole Arctic will be nothing but liquid. But wait, there's more! The crust will wear out due to the instability of the Earth's surface and fluctuating gravity. The Earth's crust is mainly made up of oxygen, which means we're basically walking on air. We might experience more earthquakes than before, and dormant volcanoes will wake up from their deep slumber. The skies will be covered in ash, making flights impossible. No one can travel by sea or by air. Importing and exporting will become history. The overall climate will get hotter, just like in Venus. The three planets orbiting each other and their huge mass might even unintentionally welcome other planets and celestial bodies to join the party. So, what if Jupiter decided to turn up? Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. To give you an idea, the Earth would be just the size of a grape if Jupiter were the size of a basketball. It also has the largest storm we can perceive. That's known as the Red Spot, a place twice the size of Earth that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for hundreds of years. Now, by the time you're done watching this video, you can expect the storm to still be going at it. Since the planet is huge, gravity must be quite strong here. 
It also has many moons, some of them of our little Earth. There will be no room for any proper space among the planets. Jupiter's moons will be thrown off course and latch onto other planets around. Some of the moons might collide with each other, causing massive debris to be displaced all over the place. The gravity of the planetary party will attract comets to enter the atmosphere, potentially crashing down on us. Oxygen levels will deplete, so the Earth's crust crumbling will continue. It'll rip open the ozone layer, causing heavy strokes of ultraviolet waves to enter our atmosphere. We won't be able to step outside for too long without some protective gear and oxygen tanks. Human civilization will change drastically. We'll all live in sheltered containers that will provide clean air and safe and filtered sun rays. The shelters will be sturdy enough to withstand frequent earthquakes. We will grow only enough crops to sustain ourselves until we leave the Earth. Since it'll only be a matter of time before the planets collide, the next step would be to create large rocket ships to fly us out of the Earth. With Mars, Venus, and Jupiter revolving close to us, it won't be easy to do so. All the space debris will be blocking us from exiting the space zone area. The only safe place outside this region will be many millions of miles away, where only single planets exist. They may or may not have the conditions to host life, but humans will have the technology to land just about anywhere with similar gravity and construct the right shelters. Eventually, Mars, Venus, Earth, and Jupiter will collide with each other and break like eggs, like a big space omelet. Don't forget the moon's crashing and breaking in the mix, but we'll already be far, far away by then, hopefully. The Grand Canyon in Arizona is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. You could even fit the whole of Manhattan in there. It's so massive, it kind of has its own weather. But the Grand Canyon isn't the only big crack out there. The Valles Marineris is bigger, way bigger. It's on Mars, and it goes nearly a quarter of the way round the planet. It's ten times as long as the Grand Canyon, and it's so deep, you could parachute into it. The Kesai Valles is also on Mars. It's made up of a series of canyons, and it might be the ancient home of a massive Mars flood. There are huge canals and canyons all over the Red Planet. There's Tiu Valles. That's where researchers think there was an epic battle between ancient Martian water and boiling hot volcanic lava. Guess we know who won that one. Equally impressive is Ares Valles. It's the longest known drainage system around. It might be weird to think of Mars as having huge waterways, rivers, and floodplains. But in its early days, Mars might have had a warm and wet climate. Now it's just dried up canyons as far as the eye can see. The Ithaca Chasma looks like a giant scar on Saturn's moon Tethys. It's four times longer than the Grand Canyon and about three times as deep. And it's billions of years old. No one's been kayaking there yet. We've only seen a photo of it, thanks to the spacecraft Voyager 1. Mercury's Great Valley makes the Grand Canyon look like a tiny pothole. NASA's Messenger spacecraft was the first to snap some photos of this massive formation. The valley's surrounded by two giant somethings, the Enterprise and Belgica, whatever that means. Pluto's largest moon, Charon, has a canyon named Argo Chasma, and it's huge. Even though Pluto's not called a planet anymore, it can still brag about its huge canyon. Even right here on Earth, the Grand Canyon has some serious rivals. Yarlung Tsangpo Canyon is the deepest canyon on Earth. It's in the Himalayas, in Tibet. Some people call it the Everest of Canyons, you could fit a 2,000-story building in it. The Indus River Gorge is big and gnarly. It's in Pakistan, and you could stack three football fields inside it. The Indus River, one of the largest rivers in Asia, passes through it, and it's even home to baleen whales and porpoises. The Colca Canyon in Peru is a short, 
but insanely bumpy bus ride away from Machu Picchu. It's the massive home for the largest flying bird in the world, the Andean condor. It has a wingspan of 10 feet. In Nepal, where the Himalayas are, is the spectacular Kali Gandaki Gorge. No one knows exactly how far down it goes, but it's probably around five times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's got it all. Crazy terrain, thin air, and it's in the middle of nowhere. So beware, only experienced hikers should dare go in. The Copper Canyon in northern Mexico is home to a world-famous group of people who run marathons, or even double marathons, just for fun. There are six canyons all joined together, and in its widest part are two of Mexico's tallest waterfalls. Copper Canyon also has one of the longest zip lines in the world, and one of the scariest train rides you'll ever take. And don't look down. Even in the US, there's a lesser known canyon that's deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's Hell's Canyon. And it's sort of on the border between Oregon and Idaho. It was carved out by the Snake River. Hell's Canyon is home to the Seven Devils mountain range. The King's Canyon is in the Yosemite National Park area. It's about one and a half times as deep as the Grand Canyon. Nearby is the second largest tree on Earth, General Grant. The largest canyon in Australia is the Caperty Canyon, and you can get paid to go there. Mm, sort of. A few lucky cyclists and campers over the years have found gemstones on the banks of the Caperty River. If you're lucky, you'll also see some 2,000-year-old rock art. The Tiger Leaping Gorge is right out of a fairy tale, but it's very real, very deep, and pretty scary. The legend says that a tiger was being chased, and it leapt over the river at the bottom of the gorge, with a little help from a perfectly placed rock right in the middle of the river. The Great Rift Valley is 15 times longer than the Grand Canyon. So what, that's like a trillion miles long? It goes through two continents and is home to about 30 lakes. It's even visible from outer space. So if you're ever floating out there in the cosmos, keep an eye out for it. The Kota Hawasi Canyon is deep, very deep. It has extreme rafting, kayaking, and hiking. And apparently the mosquitoes are pretty extreme too. There's one canyon in Tibet that I'm pretty sure holds a world record. Try looking up the Polong Tsangpo Canyon. No images pop up. It's 2021, that's insane. What's down there? Yeah, probably just a river and stuff. Colombia's Chicamoca Canyon is pretty much as deep as the Grand Canyon. Extreme sports own this place. Zip lining, canoeing, paragliding. Heck, even their cable car is extreme. It's a 25 minute ride and it's steep. Under Greenland is the Greenland Grand Canyon and it goes for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Water from melting icebergs runs through the canyon. It was actually NASA who discovered it. There's an absolutely massive canyon in Antarctica. The only problem, you can't see it. But apparently, it's freezing cold and mostly white. The sea has some mighty canyons too. The Zemchuk Canyon is one of the biggest underwater canyons. It's right off the coast of Alaska, and it's home to seals, dolphins, and whales. The deepest underwater canyon is about six times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's the famous Mariana Trench. Make it to the bottom, and you'll break the world record for deepest dive ever. The Grand Bahama Canyon is another underwater marvel. You could just keep dropping Empire State Buildings in there, and you'd never see them on the surface. Monterey Bay is pretty laid back, but its canyon is anything but. There's lanternfish, squid, sea turtles, rockfish, and sea otters all hanging out together. Oh, and thousands of jellyfish, so take care not to get stung too much. There's also giant kelp around there, a seaweed that can grow up to 100 feet long. The Hudson Canyon runs from the New York Harbor right into the sea, and it's gross. Sure, it has deep sea coral and sponge formations, but it also has a whole bunch of trash and sewagey sludge coating the bottom. 
The Aviles Canyon is off the coast of Spain. It's one of the deepest underwater canyons in the world, and it's one of the few places where giant squid live. It's famous for its white coral and the fact that it's insanely cold. Bremer Canyon in Australia is underwater, massive, and dangerous, especially if you're a giant squid. That's the favorite snack of the local orca, the huge whale with a monster appetite. Bremer Canyon's a major tourist destination these days, especially for those looking to snap a pic of the more than 100 orcas that call it home. The Nazare Canyon is near Portugal. It's the largest submarine canyon in Europe, and it's around three miles deep. That's six of the world's tallest buildings. It forms high breaking waves, so it's become a haven for big wave surfers. The Canadian Arctic Rift System is huge. It goes all the way from the Labrador Sea to the Arctic Archipelago, and it connects the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. So picture this. Greenland used to be smashed up against Canada some millions of years ago. Thanks to this rift system, Greenland's been slowly drifting away. Think how huge Canada would be if you added Greenland onto it. You and your camera have been literally everywhere on Earth, on top of Mount Everest and at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. You've seen the Nile River, Niagara Falls, the Sahara Desert, the Grand Canyon, and a million other beautiful places. On every trip, you brought back breathtaking pictures. Your album is already as thick as an encyclopedia, and it's time to discover a whole new world of tourism. Let's head on a voyage to Mars. You're sitting in a shiny modern rocket, counting down for takeoff. It might seem like a big deal, but with modern technology, it's practically a ride on a bus. In only a couple of hours, you're on the surface. It's time to head to the first destination for any tourist on Mars, Olympus Mons. It's the size of the entire state of Arizona and is 16 miles high. That's three times the size of Mount Everest. And it's the highest mountain in our entire solar system. It's actually even more than a mountain. It's a giant volcano. This entire mountain was formed when streams of lava rose to the surface, flowed down the volcano slopes and slowly cooled. The freshest soil layers are about 2 million years old. So scientists don't rule out the possibility that this volcano will wake up one day. Hopefully you're not close by when it erupts. And there are statues of Greek deities everywhere. There's Apollo, and there Athena and Artemis, and here's Zeus and Neptune. In the myths, these deities lived on Mount Olympus in Greece. These aren't natural, of course. We built these monuments to attract more tourists. There are even plenty of souvenir stalls where you can buy a lightning t-shirt in honor of Zeus. You take your first picture on Mars and move on to the next exciting place. This is a complex of 12 giant volcanoes. Some of them reach almost the height of Olympus. It's like if you piled 60 Empire State Buildings on top of each other. They're so tall because gravity is much weaker on Mars than on Earth. There isn't as much force pushing down on them, so they can grow much bigger than anything you could find on Earth. You feel lighter than you've ever felt before, and you can lift objects three times as heavy as you could back home. It's easy to see why the volcanoes are so big when you jump and fly nine feet into the air. These volcanoes have been erupting for almost two billion years. That's almost half the age of our home planet. That's another reason they've gotten so tall. Click, the photo is ready, and you get on the rover to explore the next landmark, Valles Marineris. This is the largest canyon in the world. It's longer than the distance from New York to Miami, and it's four times bigger than the Grand Canyon here on Earth. We don't know exactly how it came to be, but the most popular theory suggests that it was all because of the lava, which pushed the crust upward as it moved underground. Over time, these valleys grew into the enormous canyon of Valles Marineris. The next stop is Sidonia. The cool thing about this place is the giant rock with a human face. In 1976, we saw photos from the surface of Mars and could clearly recognize a human head here. 
people immediately came up with a thousand theories as to how it could have appeared here. The fun theorizing and speculation came to an end, though, when new photos were taken in 2011. These clearer pictures showed that the eyes, nose, and mouth were just shadows that couldn't be picked out in the original, low-quality image. In fact, it's just a hill, a lot less exciting up close. Wear a warm jacket to view the next landmark spot. This is the North Pole. Make sure you keep a tight hold of your camera, too. It's pretty windy out here. That ice that you see is carbon dioxide, which looks like that because of the extremely low temperatures. It can get cold here at negative 226 degrees Fahrenheit. This cold place and the North Pole are responsible for the strong winds all over the planet. And there are even geysers at the South Pole. In spring, when it gets warmer, jets of carbon dioxide rush to the surface, taking dust and sand with them. Quick, get it on your camera! Various studies say that there is an underground lake as wide as Delaware Bay, one mile beneath a thick layer of ice. Moving on to Gale Crater. This is where the Curiosity rover landed in 2012. Oh, and here is its replica. This little guy has been studying the surface of Mars for years and has found signs of evaporated water. This means that Mars could have fostered life in the past. The rover also found a lot of evidence of organic molecules, as well as methane gas. It could come from microbes and other living things, but we don't know enough yet to say for sure. The existence of life on Mars hasn't been confirmed, but it's exciting to think that there could have been real Martians alive at some point. You take a selfie, like you're holding Curiosity on your arm. Great, the Mars cab is already here for you, and you're heading toward Medusa Fosse. Many people believe that this could be an alien crash site because of the strange appearance of these rocks. Of course, that's not true. Scientists suggest that volcanoes have been erupting here for years. Lava has cooled into rocks, and strong winds have given them strange shapes. This entire volcanic deposit covers an area the size of a fifth of the United States. And here's a place that has made Earth scientists nervous and even scared. Hail Crater and these lines on the slopes. Studies have shown that this place was moistening, meaning that water could flow there. But then it was determined that it was dry sand streams. Scientists fear this place may be home to alien microbes, so you probably shouldn't get too close. Another mysterious place for tourists on Mars is ghost dunes. In the ancient times of this planet, there were dunes dozens of feet high. But then, they were flooded by water or lava. Their bases are preserved, but the tops have been erased. The covered areas of these dunes can still harbor microbes. Here, they are protected from wind and solar radiation and may still be preserved. Contact with them can be dangerous for humans, so you take a photo from afar. The next spot is on Mars's satellite, Phobos. Oh, there's a pretty big crowd of people gathered here. And then you see it, Phobos Monolith. It's a massive rock as tall as a 30-story building. We learned about this object from pictures taken back on Earth. The monolith casts a great shadow and has spawned many theories. For example, some claim that it was built by an ancient civilization or was left here by aliens. It might even have been a beacon. All these people came here to test the theory for themselves, but it just looks like a rock up close. One more photo and you have to hurry to the bus that will take you to Jupiter's satellite, Io. It's only safe to be here in special capsule cars that fly over the surface. And when you see volcanoes constantly erupting, you understand why. Jupiter's gravity compresses the insides of Io. They heat up and rise to the surface, erupting in volcanoes on its surface. They eject so much material that Io completely changes its surface every few millennia. Now we turn on the hyperdrives and head out into deep space. Here, in complete darkness, is the Voyager probe. It was launched in 1977 and is still in operation. It's the first human-made object to leave our solar system's borders and is the world's most distant spacecraft. 
Voyager carries a golden disk with a message for extraterrestrial civilizations. This amazing disk contains pictures of Earth's landscapes, people, animals, and various sounds and music. Unfortunately, it will take many thousands of years to reach the nearest star system, so we're not very likely to hear back from any aliens anytime soon. You take selfies and move on to the next part of the tour. Here, a thousand light years from Earth, is a black hole, the most mysterious and heaviest object in the universe. It weighs as much as the sun, but it's much smaller. It's so heavy that it attracts absolutely everything, even light. So the black hole isn't actually black. It has no color at all. You can only observe it from a very great distance because it bends time. The closer you are to it, the slower time will go. And if you want to fly just a second closer to it, weeks or even months might pass on Earth in that time. In the old tradition, you toss a coin into the black hole and continue your journey through the distant cosmos. On the way home, you have to stop by an iconic spot on the moon. Here in the Sea of Tranquility, there's an entire park near the landing site of Apollo 11. This is where the first human set foot on the surface of the moon. Neil Armstrong's first boot print is still there on the surface as proof. It was made in 1969, but even now, it looks exactly the same. Millions of people around the world go out on the streets and rooftops to look at the amazing cosmic phenomenon. Another planet right next to the moon, a big red one. At first, everyone's excited. Mars showing up out of nowhere is having a strange effect on humanity. Just as the moon can affect the psychological and physical state of some people, Mars's unexpected visit is causing people to behave pretty strangely. Every night, the sky is lit up by the white light of the moon and the red glow of Mars. Many people get a sort of instant insomnia. Some even stop drinking coffee because they no longer feel sleepy. Mars brings out energy and a little wildness in people, <laughs> making them laugh more, and even drives a few poor people crazy. They begin to go out of their houses more often and enjoy the unusual night sky. A few days later, everybody can see what's happening. Mars is getting bigger. Scientists announced that the red planet is slowly moving towards Earth. A collision is inevitable. Earthlings only have a few years left. A few months ago, a huge asteroid crashed into the red planet with such force that Mars simply flew out of its own orbit and went rogue. The chance that Mars would fly close to Earth was always going to be pretty high. After about three seconds of being announced, the news went viral, and panic set in. The situation's getting worse and worse. The closer Mars gets, the more it affects people on a physical level. Hundreds of videos pop up showing collision simulations of Mars and Earth. And there's no happy ending. Want to see what happens? One famous blogger asked her followers. The Earth's almost completely covered with water, and Mars is all dust, sand, and rocks. Then she puts a huge watermelon in the middle of her room. From the far end, she launches a bowling ball at it. Strike! Mars looks almost the same size as the Moon now. It's about to come into the Moon's orbit, and it's affecting the Earth's magnetic field. Floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, powerful thunderstorms – they go from bad to worse. Animals go crazy. Birds no longer migrate south. The polar northern lights appear in the Caribbean. The economy isn't handling the news that well. People stop showing up to work. Why wouldn't they? They just want to have fun and be with loved ones. There are enough resources on the planet to last until the catastrophe, so no one's even trying to fix the Earth's problems. Clothing, food, cars, yachts, whatever, everything loses its value and becomes free. Every day, huge street parties pop up all over the world. People decide to live their last months in peace and harmony. The global catastrophe is uniting humanity like never before. To go out with a bang, Earthlings team up to organize a huge rock concert. The red giant destroying our beautiful blue planet. Yeah, rock and roll's the perfect soundtrack. There's just enough time to eat, dance, party, and listen to good music. 
Huge stages are built all over the planet. It's every musician's last concert. During all that preparation, hope suddenly appears. Scientists have calculated all the events that'll occur when Mars crashes into Earth, and they have a simple plan. Luckily, humans had already planned on moving to Mars, so they already have been building spaceships for years. There's no time to get to another planet before the collision. But the good news is that people can wait out the disaster just outside Earth's orbit. You get to sit in a space station, munch some popcorn, relax, and enjoy the show. When the dust settles, it might just be possible to return to Earth, or what's left of it. After learning about this plan, people start working on finishing the ships night and day. Everyone in the world pitches in. There are still two years left before the big day. The huge concert stages are converted into more space stations. Mars is now giving people more energy, and with epic teamwork, people manage to create thousands of stations in just a few months. That's what happens when 7 billion people work together. Farmers, physical therapists, chefs, engineers, athletes, accountants, all on the same team. Mars is now closer to us than the Moon. The red giant blocks out the sun and our planet is plunged into darkness. There are only a few days left. People are working like ants in a massive colony, putting the finishing touches on several hundred thousand space stations. It takes four whole days for everyone to get on board. Plus, there's the loading of supplies. Animals, fish, seeds, plants, vegetables, fruits, video games, fruit roll-ups. The red giant is scheduled to enter Earth's orbit in a couple of days. That's when it will really pick up speed. Mars is only a little more than half the size of Earth. But up in the sky, it looks infinitely huge. The ships start taking off. People take a last look around, memorizing every inch. In a few hours, it'll all change forever. The stations fly up far enough away to clear any orbits. Two worlds colliding together should still have a soundtrack, though. Rock stars on every ship organize an outer space music festival. To the awesome sound of rock, Mars enters Earth's atmosphere and burns a thin layer of its own surface. This releases an incredible amount of energy. It gets faster and faster and smashes into the Pacific Ocean. A huge blast wave sweeps across the entire planet. Everything is lit up by flames, and everyone on the ships has to put on sunglasses to avoid being blinded. Our blue planet is turning into a fiery one. The dust of Mars mixes with the water of Earth. The force of the impact goes through the Earth's crust into the liquid-hot magma. Hundreds of pieces of Mars, some the size of entire countries, are somehow floating in the atmosphere. The collision generates so much energy that all oceans boil and evaporate. Seas and rivers of molten metal are now spreading all over Earth. Days, weeks, months pass. A belt made up of bits of Mars forms around the Earth. It's like a fiery version of Saturn. It'll take a long time before it's safe to land back down. But humanity can't stay alive on the ships all that time. Food, water, and oxygen will run out after a few years. But scientists already have a plan. The ships flip a switch and become huge cryo chambers. The ships are equipped with energy panels, and the roasting hot Earth's giving off a lot of energy. Totally enough to keep the ships working while everyone on board takes a few thousand year nap. As soon as the planet cools down, humans will wake up. Hundreds of thousands of years pass. One day, alarms go off simultaneously on all the ships. People wake up, slowly. Their bodies are exhausted, but after a few billion cups of coffee, everyone's ready to go. Down on Earth, new continents should have formed, and the atmosphere is most likely way different. The planet might have lost its original orbit, so it might be spinning at a different angle. The seasons as we know them, gone. All the water on Earth evaporated in the first few hours. But there were huge glaciers on Mars, which might have melted on impact. Mars may have shared its water with our planet. The clouds of dust and dirt should have settled by now, and the ground should be pretty good for growing stuff on. All that magma probably spewed up a bunch of useful minerals and chemicals. It's going to be difficult, but humanity somehow must adapt to the new Earth. People are ready for anything. 
all the Earthlings run to the nearest windows to see what their beloved planet looks like after all these centuries. Um, where is it? People are craning their necks, looking out at the empty spot where the Earth used to be. The impact of Mars was so strong that it pushed the Earth out of its orbit around the Sun. It's gone. Great. What are we gonna do now? Some bearded guy grabs a guitar and says, Let's play! It seems to feel at home on any planet, we need the four crucial elements. Air, water, earth, and fire. I'm gonna tell you what you need to squeeze to get a glass of water on Mars, how to grow your salad there, charge your phone without getting an astronomical electricity bill, and even generate some fresh air. What if I tell you there's an ocean on Mars? Right, you won't believe me, but there used to be an ocean. Scientists believe that nearly one-third of the planet was covered with an ocean called Oceanus Borealis. Once upon a time, about 3.8 to 4.1 billion years ago, the climate on Mars was warmer and the atmosphere was denser. But over time, the climatic conditions changed dramatically and this once endless ocean simply evaporated into the atmosphere. According to estimates, only about 1% of all water evaporated, while 99% is still locked on the red planet. So, there are two sources of water now, the ice polar caps and the rocks. Ice polar caps are pretty simple to understand, as we have the very same thing on Earth, but rocks containing water. I mean, my juicer won't handle stones inside it, but let's delve into these stones just a little bit. For starters, there are at least four types of hydrous minerals on Mars. There are hydrous clays made of silicon oxygen, and the cool thing about them is that they can even contain magnesium and iron, which will come in handy once we start dwelling on Mars. Next is hydrous sulfates, which are sulfur-based. Don't ew, I know you thought of the rotten egg smell, but it's typical of hydrogen sulfide and not just sulfur. These minerals have water incorporated right into their chemical formulas. Next comes hydrous silica, which also has water locked in its formula. Carbonate salts found on Mars may not contain actual H2O, but they can only form if there's water nearby, so they just prove there used to be an ocean. But if the scientists don't come up with an idea on how to extract water from those rocks, there's a backup plan. In 2020, Researchers discovered liquid water sources which may be a part of a huge network of underground saltwater lakes. So I guess we'll find a way to stay hydrated on Mars. We can either look for those water sources better, or just invent some technologically advanced juicer to squeeze water out of those stones. The red planet may seem to us as a lifeless desert where nothing can grow. But today it's a misconception as there's been a couple of recent updates concerning the agricultural potential of Mars. In 2022, a group of scientists made something unbelievable. They managed to grow an Earth plant on Mars. Disclaimer, it's not that they plowed Mars, watered it, added fertilizers, and patiently waited for the first sprouts to show up. They experimented on Earth, but the conditions they created were purely Martian. You see, a plant needs soil, water, food, and sunlight to grow. Food and sunlight can be created artificially, so the scientists focused on the soil and water in their experiments. There's not much Mars can offer in terms of soil, but it's rich in basalt. Plants don't fancy residing in basalt, as it doesn't have many nutrients, but still, some of them aren't that picky when it comes to soil. As we already know, Water on Mars is problematic too, but it can be found in limited amounts. Still, it can't be used for agricultural needs due to its chemical composition. Long story short, it's just way too salty for any plant out there to like it. But to keep the experiment true to life, the scientists started to look for possible ways of desalinating water. Thus, they added the bacteria known as Sinecococcus, and even though the saline levels decreased dramatically, it was still not enough to satisfy the finicky plants. Luckily, the scientists had Plan B, and it worked out. They took the bacteria desalinated water and filtered it through basalt. In the end, 
they noticed that the resulting water was suitable for the plants. But that's just a theory. Let's see what we can actually grow on Mars. The scientists experimented with turnips, lettuce, radishes, and alfalfa. At first, turnips, lettuce, and radishes refused to flourish in basalt and feed on that filtered water. But then alfalfa came into play and it left the scientists stunned. The plant did really well in Martian conditions. This might seem to be the logical end of the experiment, and after all, alfalfa is pretty cool. It's rich in vitamin K, it has vitamin C, some vitamins B, zinc, and phosphorus. And you can Google a bunch of nice salads with alfalfa sprouts. But it has yet another property that may be a total game changer. Because of its deep roots, alfalfa can help fix soil nitrogen fertility. So once the scientists harvested the first Martian alfalfa, they immediately planted turnips, lettuce, and radishes back. This time, the crops did way better, and the scientists even noticed something they didn't expect. Turnip yields increased by 311%. I guess alfalfa has all the chances to become the star of Mars terraforming. Whoops, here comes the bad news. Even though you can theoretically stay hydrated on Mars and enjoy a fresh salad, at the moment, there's almost no way you can enjoy some fresh air on the red planet. Hey, you've noticed I said almost? Even though Mars' atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide, we already know how to make small amounts of oxygen there. Meet the Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, but you can call it MOXIE. It's a little helper that works together with Mars rovers. This little guy can isolate oxygen on Mars and it already managed to produce 5 grams of it. It may sound like nothing, but 5 grams of oxygen equals 10 minutes of breathing. For now, MOXIE is for scientific use only, but it can actually help facilitate missions on Mars. Thing is, it's easier to produce oxygen directly on the spot than transport it from Earth to Mars. At the moment, MOXIE is not powerful enough. But once the scientists invent its descender, the air situation on Mars will change. For the fire to burn, we need one essential thing, which is oxygen. And we don't want to waste the results of MOXIE's hard work, especially if there can be alternatives. Historically, people would use fire to cook, get warm, and probably scare away some uninvited guests like saber-toothed tigers. Today, we can use electricity to cook and get warm, and no saber-toothed tiger has ever been spotted roaming the red planet. So let's see how people can generate electricity on Mars. There are quite a few options. Solar, geothermal, and wind energy can be used on Mars almost the same way we use them on Earth. Solar energy is promising, but it still won't be as effective as on Earth. Sunlight on Mars is only 43% as strong as it is in Earth's orbit. So, producing electricity this way will take more effort. Don't forget about dust storms that aren't rare on Mars. During them, the sunlight gets sorta blocked. So should we ever rely on solar energy on Mars, we must be ready for occasional electrical outages. The next problem is seasonal variations. So we could benefit from solar power for only some months of the Martian year. And, of course, no solar energy at night. Anyways, this option might work out, but it should be combined with some alternative. For instance, wind power. Wind turbines won't have any problems working during the dust storm. And they also work at night. Seems like these two sources are a perfect combo. But geothermal energy could be a cool backup plan, though. It can even work on Mars better than on Earth for a few reasons. First, the atmospheric pressure is lower on Mars, so more volumes of steam can be generated to drive the turbine. Second, Mars' surface temperature is lower and it can help too as it will increase the efficiency due to thermodynamic laws. Third, no water needed. We could use liquid carbon dioxide instead and it would work perfectly. And unlike water, liquid carbon dioxide is free. The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. 
The crack is getting bigger by the second, and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships, and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome, and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, 
because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now, but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off, so you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface, but nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew.